not obsessing over coffee or pour, uh, pouring through petroleum literature. He really likes to do a lot of rugby. I think that's him getting squished in the middle here. And then he, uh, he really loves looking into culinary efforts. And then of course, trying to take over the Thor franchise from Chris Hemsworth. And he's still waiting on the call from Marvel. I know you probably can't tell which one of these people is Brian, but it's, it's this guy here on the left. So with that, Brian, let's, uh, let's hear your talk. Can't wait for it. Thanks, Graham. Um, if you caught last week's talk, um, I pretty much just laid the groundwork for production engineering and the link to RTA uh, to try and set the scene a little bit for why we should be using it. For today's talk, I'm going to dive a little bit deeper and explain five specific reasons that we need to be using and caring about RTA as production engineers. And so the general outline will cover these five points. The first one is production decisions. Our production decisions have real impacts on RTA analysis and the characterization of the reservoir that comes from it. Then we'll talk a little bit about RTA and forecasting, um, eliminating the IPR TPR analysis. Some may perform this. I really haven't met the production engineer who has or who makes that a routine part of their job. Then we'll go into optimizing artificial lift and wellbore design and what we can do around that. And finally, improving your economic analysis, uplifts included. But to start off, I wanted to take another quote from the production text I recommend, Brilliant Production Systems by Economies, which says that all well deliverability equations, think reservoir deliverability equations, relate the well production rate and the driving force in the reservoir. And we can see that in these equations here. But the quote goes on to really establish the link and the influence that production engineering has on these equations and on reservoir performance. And the quote continues, the bottom hole pressure is a function of wellhead pressure, which in turn depends on production engineering decisions. So this kind of lays the groundwork for how production engineers influence rate transient analysis and reservoir characterization. And with that, last time I introduced this cartoon, it's a schematic uh, showing the petroleum system and how we could approximate that as a system of nodes or elements and nodes with each element being a component of the reservoir production system. Um, and specifically for today, I'll just be talking about the outflow or the wellbore and the inflow, the reservoir. And what's important to note is that these two are linked by bottom hole flowing pressure, which is why that is such a critical component for RTA analysis. So the simplified production system would look like this for the talk today, where the flow equation describing flow within the wellbore element is given by the mechanical energy equation and the flow within the reservoir is given by some form of the reservoir deliverability equation. That's it, that's for the most part as technical as the equations get for my talk. I wanna try and keep it high level and practical for anyone who this might be new material for, but what, what influence do we actually have or how do we tie that concept of production decisions influencing bottom hole pressure and influencing RTA to a real world example. And so here we have just a basic case of liquid loading. This is the Marcellus. It was a well that was turned online late December of 2017 and it was flowed and still is flowed up casing. And so the question the production engineers in the room are probably asking is when did this thing start loading? And some people might immediately have their eye drawn towards this point, which would be predicted by Coleman. Um, but, but really, the keen engineer would probably look at the pressures and say, Turner is a better approximation for critical rate and loading in this well. And we can, in fact, see using Turner, all of these cases of loading and unloading events that were occurring leading up to that major sustained loading event. And investigating this further by looking at casing head pressure, we can see that for each one of those unloading events, there was a step change in casing pressure indicating some form of choke management on this well. But what is that? That's just 
basic loading for production engineers. We do this all the time. This is typical. How does it relate to RTA reservoir? And I'm going to draw that analogy through the specialized plots. So the specialized plot is a very important tool for reservoir characterization and RTA analysis. And specifically, I want to point you guys towards the square root time plot. As production engineers, we're used to looking at data chronologically. And the square root time form of the RPI or specialized plot maintains that chronological order of the data. And so essentially, it's just a plot of the reciprocal productivity index versus this time function. And there's a lot of things that we can learn from these plots once we start getting familiar with using them. Um, but for these unconventional systems, they'll tend to exhibit a straight line behavior on this plot during linear transient flow. So something like this. Um, the y-intercept here tells us something about fracture conductivity and completion. And the slope tells us something about the linear flow parameter or the performance of the SRV. And I know John is going to be talking about this in more detail in his presentation later on. But for practical takeaway for a production engineer, any deviations upwards from this line or the straight line behavior is a productivity loss. And any deviations downwards indicate productivity improvement. We can see that by looking at the, you know, the normalized pressure components um, on the y-axis. And so let's plot that example of the liquid loading well. So you can see clearly the linear transient behavior, and you can start to see if you have a keen eye, all of those productivity losses associated with early liquid loading. So the deviations upwards are liquid loading, then the deviation downwards reestablishes that linear trend. That's due to opening the choke and the choke effects. And so we can begin to see how our decisions as production engineers influence these kinds of analyses. But even bigger than that, how does that lead to reservoir characterization? What we're ultimately trying to do in RTA with production data is to use that data to extrapolate a reservoir signal that helps us estimate SRV, rock, and fluid properties in order to solve that reservoir deliverability equation that we saw earlier, and which is at the top right of the, the screen. And so there's lots of sources of productivity loss, but production engineers are primarily focused on those in the choke and the wellbore, and we need to minimize those to help get as clean a signal as possible to help aid in reservoir characterization. And that looks like this. So. We were fortunate with this example to have a well right next door producing in the Marcellus that was tilled at the same time but was run with two and seven eighths tubing already installed. So what you can see is the production data's, uh, data graphs plotted at the top and below them a specialized plot. And for the case of the liquid loaded well, you can see all of that erratic production behavior and on the right, all of that noise is taken out. You see this very strong linear transient flow signal. And what's key here is one of the things that we're trying to get out of this is the approximate time to end of linear flow, which would be marked by a deviation upwards. But if you have these other productivity losses causing a deviation upwards, you're not really sure where that transition occurs. And you can see that in the characterization of the reservoir, specifically the half length in this case, where you have a 200 foot half length difference between these two cases, which were similar completions, same reservoir, same initial pressure. The only difference is the uncertainty introduced by the liquid loading. So, so what's the big picture there for production engineers? It's, it's nice to see this and to understand on a plot, but if we can eliminate these sources of productivity loss. It helps us get better, higher confidence estimates of our half length. That has impacts to our frac design and optimization, to infill development. How many wells are we going to need to adequately drain a particular portion of the reservoir? That could then influence the drill schedule, capital allocation, 
and some production engineers may have experience with frack hit mitigation. So if we plan infill activity, how far away for a given design might we expect to see some half length propagation? And so those are all of the things when it comes to reservoir characterization and the influence our decisions have on it that we need to be mindful of. And that's the first reason, and maybe one of the most important is that once we start understanding these, we can communicate better with our reservoir engineers and we can start asking some dangerous questions about, you know, what does it look like on a specialized plot? Are we in boundary dominated flow yet, etc. And so from reservoir characterization comes reservoir history matching and ultimately forecasting. And you can see here the history matches obtained in the two cases are quite different. In the case of the tubing flow well, we have a very nice reservoir history match on both rate and pressure, whereas the match for the liquid loading case begins to fall apart for both rate and pressure. It no longer matches the data. And that's because we're using surface measurements to estimate a bottom hole pressure. And those correlations that we talked about last week fall apart once we begin to liquid load. So now the second reason is improving your forecasts. When we talk about decline curve analysis with the traditional technique for forecasting well performance, these were techniques developed for conventional wells and boundary dominated flow with B factors between zero and one. And when we started exploring and developing unconventional systems, we noticed that these transient flow behaviors exhibited B factors much greater than one, leading to overestimation of reserves or hydrocarbon in place. And often in the case, some of these reservoir systems like the Haynesville that are severely overpressured allow the opportunity for changing um, geomechanical conditions or effects on the reservoir or choke practices to create multiple decline segments that you now have to match depending on what your choke management program might look like. And this then led to modifications to ARP's decline curve analysis to try to counter some of these issues that we had trying to apply ARPs in these unconventional systems. And primarily they were the modification of an exponential switch. So yes, we have a B factor that's super har uh, harmonic, which will lead to overestimation of reserves. But at some point in the future, we're just going to choose a switch point and make it go exponential and decline. The other thing was incorporating multiple decline curves together and coupling them in order to try and match whatever our decline profile might look like. And so for an example of this, continuing with the well that had tubing installed, I went ahead and did a auto forecast of the decline curve profile in Harmony. And what you can see here is the, the one year fit of the data gave me a B factor of 1.66, which is the blue curve. And then I went ahead and forced different B factors into the future because we really are unsure about whether the well is in boundary dominated flow or not. It seemed to exhibit linear transient flow still. And so you can see this wide range of possible decline curves. And the horizontal line that I drew through there is the predicted Turner critical rate. So if we're trying to answer the question, when will this well liquid load, we really don't have high confidence. The, the range we see here is six years on this well. Um, and in that, that most conservative case, that was just auto fitting and forecasting the last most recent four months, which should be the best indication of when the well will liquid load. So these were all modified hyperbolic declines. They had exponential switches. And this is kind of the best we can do. And, and these kind of issues led to modern decline curve analysis where we recognized that you can no longer just look at a pressure, uh, a rate profile in order to forecast a well. You now have to include pressures and understand how drawdown on the reservoir relates to pr production rate. So for modern decline curve analysis, we began to normalize the rate and time uh, to, to account for pressure. And essentially that is RTA and what it does. 
And so what does a RTA based forecast look like? If you remember from the earlier slide, we got a very nice reservoir history match, which essentially enabled us to estimate the parameters in the reservoir deliverability equation. That is then used along with a forecasted pressure drawdown to come up with a decline profile for the well. And so what we can see here is that a physics backed RTA forecast actually shows this well. Instead of having a six year window, it gives you one answer um, with reasonably high certainty. So for this well, we would probably expect it to liquid load early 2023 rather than middle 2022 or um, early 2029. And so that's really powerful and it, and it rolls right into why use IPR TPR analysis anymore. It just doesn't make sense. This, this is a analysis method that is taught in school to as a way to evaluate reservoir and well performance. Uh, it's essentially just a visual representation of the solution of those two equations and the intersection point is that bottom hole pressure or that node that links them. And so some of the problems or limitations with traditional IPR TPR analysis is that firstly, we often don't know the exact solution because we don't have measurements of some of those parameters in the deliverability equation like permeability, um, would primarily permeability, but also size of the SRV can influence it. So we've been relying on correlations that were developed that often don't accurately reflect the actual production rates observed um, in the system. Uh, secondly, and this is probably the biggest point of why we should be eliminating them is the solution point for in an IPR TPR analysis is static. It only describes one point in time and so it's only useful for the day that you're performing the analysis. If you're trying to estimate uplift by downsizing tubing or lowering bottom hole pressure by installing artificial lift, you can get one point of uplift, but the next day it becomes inaccurate. So you're not able to actually characterize the uplift and then the future decline of the well through an analysis like this until you get to boundary dominated flow. The transient flow nature, the long-term transient flow complicates IPR TPR analysis further. And if you watched last week, you would have seen a presentation all around transient IPR curves, which is excellent. I highly recommend anyone who didn't see it to go back and watch this when this is posted live. But because both the flow component and the average pressure are changing under transient flow conditions, these correlations weren't really built to handle that. So it can be difficult to try and estimate what is happening in the reservoir accurately when you have transient flow conditions. And the longer you have them, the more difficult it becomes. Uh, the last one, and we kind of touched on this a little bit, was that the uplift from these analyses don't capture the future decline of that, that well performance or that well bore and reservoir deliverability. But RTA enables us to do this and not only to do this, but to do it for any point in time under any drawdown scenario. So proper characterization of the reservoir through RTA enables us to accurately describe the reservoir deliverability model so that we can play and run any scenario we want in order to determine what uplift we'll have for making those changes. And here's an example of that, just a simple wellhead compression case. Again, we saw that the RTA model predicted early 2023 was when this well would liquid load. So I forecast three scenarios, just produce the well until 2023 and then lower wellhead pressure from 900 PSI to 600, 400, and 200, and see what kind of response we would get from, from the reservoir. And as you can see, these forecasts not only give me the uplift that I need, but they also give me the decline that we should expect from that reservoir. So that's very, very powerful. And you can 
start to see how this same analysis would apply to lowering tubing to reduce a hydrostatic head if you had landed tubing too high. Uh, you can also forecast any drawdown scenario if you're trying to investigate what's the optimal choke management strategy for us and our company under different pricing environments. Uh, you can look at different wellboard design performance curves and what would it look like if we had run two and three eighths initially instead of two and seven eighths. And this is really the power for production engineers is it's that ability to forecast different drawdown scenarios, um, different wellbore designs, different artificial lift um, performance curves. And uh, you can forecast rod pump and gas lift as well. But essentially, RTA-based forecasts are providing an operating point, that intersection of the IPR-TPR for any combination of reservoir pressure drawdown and time. We're coming and close here, Brian. Last, last few slides. And so the last point is that RTA enables us to run physics-based economic scenarios. We often get into, in production engineering, we tend to adopt a try it and see approach, or we employ a, a number of workarounds to try and estimate uplift, whether it's a roughly cobbled together IPR curve with a assumption that previous decline would also continue into future decline. So some combination of DCA and IPR curves, um, but it rarely achieves the economic uh, results and long-term value that we promise the company, we promise our managers when we initially propose the project. And, and so it might not be a huge needle mover when we're looking at overall wellbore economics, but when you're starting to look at budgets, quarterly budgets based on volumes or cash flows, what are your targets, it, it starts to matter. And this is something we discussed a little bit last week um, regarding the difference between the long-term cycle view of reservoir engineers in terms of economics versus the more short-term periodic cash flow um, focus of the production engineer. So again, just to drive it home, RCA-based forecasting enables us to reliably forecast these uplifts and declining volumes to create better economic decisions. And those are the five main reasons. And once you start using it, you can come up with countless other reasons to implement and to be using uh, RTA for production engineers in your day-to-day -day job. And one thing I did wanna give was a quick shout out to some of the additional features in Harmony Enterprise. That's what I'm most familiar with. But here are a few of them, and you don't always need reservoir characterization. So there are features in Harmony where if only you only have production data, you can still do a lot of production engineering with it. Um, everything from decline curve analysis and type well forecasting to the easy and robust economic modeling that incorporates the ability to just append forecasts and put custom price decks. Uh, quick erosional velocity and hydrate predictors. You could do IPR TPR analysis, but as we touched on, I don't know why you would want to anymore. Um, and then there's the RTA modeling for our artificial lift. And I highly recommend for anyone who hasn't, check out our moderator Graham Helf Helfrich's weekly Did You Know YouTube channel, because it covers so much of the basics of what Harmony can do and it really gives a great introduction for anyone who's new to the software and trying to learn RTA about the features. And it's probably the quickest way to get up and running and doing analysis and starting to understand what you can do with it as a production engineer. And so I've included a link down below to just like the general page, but I highly recommend it for anyone who's new to RTA. And with that, I'll give it back to, to Graham. Thanks, Brian. I appreciate the shout out. Um, so one of the questions that came in is, this is relevant to one of your slides, is why does the cum gas curve change in 2018 when the rate versus time graph changes later in 2023? Because this, it's really is the same time scale, but that's in 
showing the entire decade. So that's all of the decade of 2020. So within there is 2021, 2022, 2023. So those are years. So it's it's the same, but it's just the scale of that x-axis, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I can see on the on the bottom, it's, it starts in 2010 and the top starts in, in 2019 or something. So the, the starting point's just different. Oh, yes, that that was, in, yeah, no, you're right. That was probably a poorly appended um, curve or a manipulation mistake that I made. But yeah, I see, I see your point. Cool. Cool. Okay, there's another question that says, in many papers, I saw that time to end of linear flow is not just located in the intersection point between the linear straight line and the BDF uh, straight line flow. Regularly, time to end of linear flow is located near this intersection point. Do you know the possible cause to not use this exact point? I'm not sure if that question is clear to you, Brian. I can read it again. Um, well, I think I've got it. I the the way that i think i understand it being asked and the way i would answer it is let me just go back and show this is that the onset of transitional flow because of the way we complete these unconventional systems with long horizontals and multiple fractures the traditional boundary dominated flow we would see in a vertical radial system where you've reached the extent of the reservoir. Now you're looking for fracture to fracture interference. And because of non-uniform fracture spacing, because we can't really control it, we model it as uniform often, but because these fracture spacings are non-uniform, you could start having two fractures interfering and those start to add a boundary dominated flow or depletion between the fractures, which appears as in the data as a partial boundary dominated flow. The overall system is still intransient, but you have a portion of the well that is now in boundary dominated flow. So that is the start of what is typically a long transition into boundary dominated flow. So if we could effectively remove all of these other losses and get that pure reservoir signal, that's what we would typically see. It's not the true transition to boundary dominated flow. It's a transition to transitional flow or a tr transition away from end of linear flow into transitional flow and ultimately into boundary, boundary dominated flow. Thanks, Brian. Um, I'm gonna get you to stop sharing your screen and we're gonna uh, get started with the next presenter. Thank you very much. Okay, so our next presenter is Matthias Carlson, and uh, Matthias is a general manager at Whitson, and it's a global company that spe has specialized in PVT, gas-based EUR, and gas condensate reservoirs all the way back since 1988. Uh, Matthias' main area of work involves reservoir simulation and equation of state fluid characterization. Over the last four years, he's consulted on and supervised a wide range of projects in tight unconventionals. And worth mentioning uh, are the basin-wide uh, EOS modeling developments in the Bakken, Montney, Eagleford, Scoopstack, and Permian. Uh, right now, Matthias is also working on gas EOR, specifically Huff and Puff pilots on field-wide implementation projects in the Eagleford, Permian, Bakken, and Montney. Now, in addition to just consulting, Matthias also uh, researches and teaches industry courses on advanced PVT and phase behavior, EOS model development, and gas-based EUR. Uh, Matthias holds a Master of Science degree in Petroleum Engineering from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, and he was a Fulbright Scholar at Stanford. Now, something you probably didn't know about Matthias is that he actually played soccer or football for the third best team in Norway, and Matthias says that if he was still in Norway, it would be the best team, not the third best. All right, so with that, Matthias, we look forward to your talk. Perfect. So uh, what I'll be talking about is uh, flow and bottom pressure correlations, uh, which, uh, you know, flow and bottom pressures was a huge topic in the last talk, so it's a good to follow up to that. But I'll focus on uh, mainly the impact that PVT has on these type of correlations in unconventionals. And kind of as a, as a small disclaimer there, before we go into the main topic of the presentation, I'll just uh, 
refer to one of my favorite uh, quotes that uh, knowing what you don't know is more useful than being uh, brilliant. And there are definitely more people probably in the audience as well that's more specialized when it comes to these uh, flowing bottom of pressure correlations than, than myself. But I, I'll focus on the PVT part where I know a thing or, or, or two and try to keep it as practical as, uh, as possible. And uh, hopefully the audience will, will, uh, will enjoy that. Uh, kind of just as a, a preparation for this uh, presentation, I asked our, our client base in, in North America just, just a, a very simple question. Uh, what, what is actually your preferred BHP correlation? And my, and my hope with that uh, question was, okay, maybe I'll get the very consistent answer back so I can kind of focus on one or two, two correlations. Uh, unfortunately, I actually got probably as many answers as people that I asked which was a little bit surprising uh, for myself. And, and probably my favorite answer was that I, I prefer hanging a, a pressure gauge. Uh, is that a choice? And, and obviously everybody knows that a, a, uh, a actual measurement of these pressures would be the best, but in the realm of this presentation, we'll focus on the, the cases, which is relevant for a lot of uh, wells where you actually don't have measured uh, bottom hole pressure, uh, pressures over, over time. So uh, kind of just to set the stage for the presentation, uh, the key takeaway from the, the short uh, poll was that I almost got as many answers to that uh, question as, uh, as people, uh, which uh, as, uh, as probably was a surprise to, to some of you as well, it was a little bit surprising to me at least. Uh, there was no to little consensus in the, uh, both you know, across the industry and regions and cities almost, and also sometimes within uh, the same companies. Uh, and it, it might make sense for the people who, who, who know this stuff because it depends on the fluids, personal preferences, maybe different, maybe something works in different basins uh, better or other aspects that I don't know anything about. Um, so, so based on that, what I wanted to look at specifically in this presentation and, and, and what I would like to convey or, or I wanted to answer actually for myself as well was three very basic questions. Um, the, the first question would be, what if we actually used separator rates instead of stock tank rates when we calculated these pressures? And this is something that I see all the time, that there's very little emphasis, uh, emphasis on this in, in many companies, that there are a big difference uh, sometimes between measured separator rates and the stock tank rates that you should uh, use. Um, what if we actually uh, used a PVT correlation instead of custom PVT? Do we actually need uh, an equation of state model and, and generate black hole tables for that? Or would we be okay with using the readily available PVT correlations in this work? And, and uh, when do we actually have to worry, at least in a larger degree, what correlation we use when it comes to only dealing with the different fluids? Um, and You'll also see throughout the, the short presentation here that I'll not focus on actually what to do, but more what not to do. And, and hopefully um, that's a nice angle to have sometimes as, um, as well. And the, how we're gonna try to answer these three simple questions is uh, we're gonna make it practical. We're gonna make it hands-on and not to mention, we're gonna work with real field data from shale wells across different unconventional basins in uh, North America. So that's mainly US and, and Canada. Uh, we're gonna also look at the key part of what we are gonna deal with, which is across different fluid, uh, different basins and fluid windows. Uh, so I've picked just uh, four different fluid systems, uh, a black oil well, a volatile oil well, a near critical volatile oil well, and a gas condensate well. And, and just for the sake of the presentation, um, I've focused on just uh, two, uh, or what I'll present is the Hagedorn Brown for, for the oil cases and the Beggs and Brills for the gas condensate case. Uh, while we actually did all the uh, calculations for, for a wide range of different uh, correlations, and I would say that the main kind of key takeaways from the presentation is relevant for uh, for all the uh, correlations. That's just uh, one thing. The second thing is, is we'll focus on, uh, the well configuration we'll focus on is just uh, uh, flow through tubing. Uh, so, so that's also just a, a disclaimer that I'll make at, uh, at this point. But let's start with, uh, with the first, uh, with the first uh, question. So what if we actually use separator rates instead of stock tank? And what is actually the difference between separator rates and stock tank? 
Well, the difference is at least many, many places in North, uh, North America, we measure the rates either at separated conditions or, or like a common tank battery uh, at some separated pressure and temperature that is higher than ambient conditions. Uh, while the, the uh, conditions you should actually use uh, uh, in, in the actual uh, uh, analysis is the stock tank rates where the, the PBT table that you are most likely going to use to make the uh, calculations would be defined at, okay? Uh, and, you know, then the question is, okay, what, what is the difference between these two and when is it more important and less important? But just to make it very, very hands-on, what we actually measure in the field is the, uh, many, many times at least, these uh, uh, GORs at separated conditions, the gas oil ratio there. Uh, while we have to apply these uh, shrinkage factors and flash factors over time to, uh, to convert these separated rates to stock tank. Uh, and the question is then, okay, but uh, is this actually changing through time? And the answer to that is definitely yes. This is just one example, not an extreme example. This is just uh, you know, something that you should expect. Uh, and if you, you can imagine if you start to apply a shrinkage factor that's constant through time of 0.8, uh, and you ignore the fact that most of the time this well will have a shrinkage factor of 0 0.9, you'll get very, very different uh, answers. Uh, so leading into the four examples that we uh, just uh, talked about, I'll just show, uh, show essentially the differences between calculating uh, bottom hole pressures with uh, uh, a, a particular correlation uh, using the separator race versus stock tank. And the nice thing is when we work with black oils, low GOR oils, the difference is very small. And we should expect them to be very small because the shrinkage factor for low GOR oils are almost, you, you can almost neglect it. And for those of you who work with PVT correlations, especially the ones that, you know, most PVT correlations you can use uh, uh, at a GOR below a thousand scuffs per barrel. And, and when you look at those uh, PVT correlations, there is, there is none of them that actually takes in the separate, separate surface process as an input. If you look at the standing correlation, for instance, that is not a, a input. While in its most rigorous implementation, you should actually take that in as an input when you're dealing with PVT tables and PVT properties. But it's just that it's not that important at low, um, at low uh, uh, GORs. The importance, however, becomes more visible as we move towards uh, uh, leaner and or more complex fluids. So for this volatile oil, we see, okay, the difference is not that, that large. We can probably neglect it even here. But once we get to near critical fluids and also gas uh, condensates, things become or may, might become uh, more important. So the key takeaway on this first item is that using separator rates will often estimate higher BHPs compared to using stock tank rates, and you'll get a falsely more productive well. So just remember that before you, if you're using these uh, BHP for your for your analysis, that will that will potentially change your your uh, your uh, result, whether you're do, dealing with well test analysis, RTA analysis, history matching, or what not. Okay. The second the second question was what what if we actually use a correlation versus custom PVT? And here custom PVT is essentially uh, uh, PVT that's generated or these tables generated from an equation of state model. So uh, in, when, it, when we're dealing with reservoir processes, the differences between a correlation and custom PVT can be very, very large for, for uh, especially complex fluids. The question is for pipe flow calculations like these, is it that important? And again, we see here for the black oil case that the differences are not that big and we can probably neglect it. It's, it's good, you know, within this uncertainty of the, of the calculation itself, and we can probably get away with, uh, with uh, just uh, using a correlation, which is good for computational speed and, and these things. Uh, the same goes for volatile oil, uh, oil case. The same goes, and that's the same conclusion for the near critical uh, fluids. Uh, while for the gas condensate, we see that there are uh, some difference. And then the question is, okay, what is actually driving the cases when it's little or, or no difference? And that's related to the final conclusion on this topic, which was after analyzing it for a wide range of, of, of fluids, that the, the impact of using correlations versus custom PVT for BHP calculations in shale is less important than what uh, uh, at least I personally originally thought, okay? And the reasons for it is that uh, in shale reservoirs, 
at least on a relative basis, the rates are fairly low. And, it, and the pressure loss is mainly uh, uh, driven by uh, uh, the gravity turn. So what is actually important is whether the correlation is uh, uh, able to predict okay to accurate uh, densities and, and not to capture all the, all the uh, super complex um, uh, PBT. Okay, so the case, uh, so, so the kind of the, the conclusion on that topic was that uh, it's depending on how accurate the correlation that you're using is in order to, to capture the density predictions in, I guess, across the well bore. Okay, so that can be much more important for reservoir processes, but if you're using correlations in, 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 in calculating bottom uh, pressures, you should be okay in, uh, in general. The last topic that I just wanted to, to touch uh, base on was uh, the potential impact on our picking a wrong correlation or when, when, when will that be more or less uh, important. So what we did was to run a set of, um, of BHP uh, calculations for these different fluids um, and uh, essentially just provide a range of the minimum and maximum when it comes to, uh, to uh, or the most optimistic and the least optimistic uh, case from, from running those calculations. And, and we see that there's some discrepancy, and this is like something we see all the time if you make this calculation that, you know, when you're dealing with simple fluids, undesaturated fluids, almost all the correlations are overlapping. While when you get into to, uh, to something that uh, you drop below the bubble point, you get more complex uh, flow behavior going on and whatnot, these, these curves start to deviate, but this is not a huge deviation in, in, in general. And, and the same you kind of see for this volatile oil case, where um, a lot of these correlations are, are giving fairly consistent results, at least in this example. So that's also important to, to notify. While as we get into the near critical uh, fluids and we're dealing with gas condensates, the differences can be much, much larger. And the, uh, the key conclusion from, from just those simple observations is that uh, the importance of picking the correct BHP correlation is uh, increasing as the fluid, uh, fluid system becomes more, uh, more complex. Okay, so just as a, I guess a summary slide on um, the, these three things that do we wanted to, to, to look at and, and convey. Uh, if we start with using separated rates versus stock tank, uh, I guess the rule in general is to always have a, um, a very, uh, you know, uh, have a very clear relationship to whether or not you're using uh, separated rates or, or stock tank rates in your day-to-day -day calculations. But for uh, the results that we looked at, we, we saw that it was not that important to account for this in black oil, in the black oil case and the volatile oil case, but it was more important when dealing with these narrow critical fluids. This is also, uh, you know, depending on what uh, conditions your, your separator, um, separators are running at, that will also impact uh, the results of essentially this, uh, this part, which was the first answer we wanted to, or question we wanted to answer. I think for the correlation versus custom uh, BBT, uh, PBT, you should in general be uh, be okay by using correlations. Um, but you can you can probably discuss uh, with uh, with a few folks when you when you get to more complex fluids whether it's okay or 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 not. The last thing is the importance of uh, BHP correlations. We 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 see that the uh, you know you should probably always in whatever fluid system you're you're dealing with. Uh, at least make some educated uh, analysis on what uh, correlation to, to use as a default at least. But uh, the importance of picking the correct one you see is more important in this near critical um, region. And in general, when you're working with, you know, why, why do we talk about these near critical fluids and gas condensates uh, all the time? And, uh, you know, it's important reservoir processes and whatnot. But the, the reason why it's particularly important in, in these unconventionals is that a lot of the uh, a lot of the, if you look at Lovin uh, County in in uh, in Permian, for instance, it's very near critical fluid, and you get these critical transitions in essentially every single uh, basin, maybe except from the Bakken. So, uh, you know, knowing your fluids, dealing with your fluids uh, in a, in a consistent manner is is very very important for a wide range of engineering applications. That is not only in in the reservoir, but also in the tubing, and also when you get get to surface. Hey, Matthias, just about a five minute warning. Yeah, that's perfect. This is my last slide. So I'll give uh, Ty will have a lot of time uh, extra in his in his talk. So that should be good. So the uh, the, the last thing and just a summary of, uh, I guess, these three things uh, wanted to try to keep it simple. So we, we, we kind of honor the wide audience here that the correct PVT treatment for BHP is more important. So this is particularly for unconventional reservoirs and these examples we looked at. 
when uh, we're dealing with complex fluids, so near, uh, volatile uh, fluids, near critical and, and rich gas condensates. Uh, and also, there's also other aspects here that uh, I haven't emphasized. But for instance, if you have relatively uh, lower water rates compared to the other um, to the hydrocarbon contribution, that will ob obviously affect the importance of of the PVT component of the correlation uh, or, or of the calculation it, it, uh, itself. Um, so on that note, I'll um, I like to to keep it uh, keep it uh, on point. So I'll just uh, I'll just uh, take any questions and then and then Ty can start his presentation. Great, thank you, Matthias. Uh, I thought I thought this was really valuable. This is one of the most uh, you know frequent and common questions we get asked by the Harmony customers are for is for advice on exactly what you've been talking about. Um, I really like your suggestion of you know doing a, a sensitivity on the unknowns to understand the range of what the bottom hole pressure could be, because then you can apply that to your models and see what the impact that will have on all of your understanding of the reservoir. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, one question was, um, when it comes to a gas condensate well, what is your general recommendation for a, a, bottom, a bottom hole, like a, a correlation for the wellbore and a PVT correlation? Oof. Um, so for, um, through, through the kind of survey, I can, you know, uh, I can tell you the consensus from the survey. So if there was a little bit of consensus in the survey on gas condensates in, in particular, uh, I got a lot of like for, for these mixed systems, which kind of gas condensate is where you produce a lot of Condensate and gas it will be uh, bags and brills. That was uh, was uh, something that uh, came up uh, with some consistency. Uh, but I think for 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 correlations for for uh, gas condensates, I will be very very careful of using correlations for gas condensates because there's so many things that is important in creating correct PVT for for gas condensates that you can't capture in in just a simple correlation like. Uh, uh, Ovala, for instance, and we, we've done some some uh, uh, yeah, we've done a lot of uh, comparisons on that particular topic for a wide range of customers in in uh, in North America. So the go-to recommendation there is to have a field-wide equation of state uh, model that you've tuned to all the fluids you have in that particular field, which we've now developed for all the basins in North America, and just use that on, on every single well uh, basis and, and uh, use that table into Harmony if you if you use that and import it as a custom table or, or into CMG or whatever um, tool you're using for for uh, modeling gas uh, concepts. And that's uh, that's something uh, that's now you know a re readily available technology that you can apply very easily for every single uh, well that you have. Okay, uh, another question is, um, first, thank you for the presentation. And uh, do you have any recommendations on frequency of PVT sampling every three, six or 12 months? Yeah, so that's a very good uh, question. Uh, uh, depends on what you like to, to uh, answer, right? If, uh, if you want to uh, do PVT sampling on a particular well in unconventional and you're actually uh, doing a full suite of PVT experiments uh, every every third to six to twelve month, then you're. I want to know what company you're working for because you have a lot of money. But uh, if you're only doing fluid sampling to uh, analyze what uh, uh, you know how your compositions are changing through time, or you want to use it for for shrinkage calculations, uh, for instance, uh, I would sample more frequently in the early days of the life where. Uh, you you see a very very sudden drop in in the BHP uh, uh, or calculated or or measured BHPs and that's where you see a very very uh, big change in in especially how the heavier ends are are produced so you see changes in APIs that are very important to capture if you like to uh, do for instance compositional tracking or calculate daily shrinkage. Uh, uh, values over over time or or normalize for changing separated conditions and all these things or, or for facility design for that matter so i think um, sample uh, more frequently the first year and then after some time it's it's uh, it's uh, less important so the first year i would do maybe uh, you know a little bit frequently if it costs you a thousand bucks or something uh, the first uh, the first uh, few months and then uh, maybe uh, yeah, maybe skip it actually after after a year because it doesn't, the well stream compositions doesn't change that much through time. Great. Uh, I'm going I'm to ask one last question, and then we're going to move on to Tyler. So the question is, uh, again, thanks for the presentation. Based on your experience, do uh, PVT correlations to calculate total GOR from the first stage separator GOR work well? <laughs> 
That's a good uh, good question because we uh, we uh, we we actually presented a paper in uh, Saudi Arabia earlier this year on exactly that topic where we uh, provided essentially the correlation for doing that. And on paper, you should uh, be able to uh, to have something very very accurate because you're essentially dealing with the separator fluid would be a low GUR uh, oil. Now it will have a GUR less than a thousand scuffs per barrel. So on paper, uh, you should have a very, uh, fairly accurate uh, calculation. Uh, so uh, so the, you would expect it to be uh, accurate, but uh, uh, you know, I would probably argue that uh, right now you can, you can do it uh, with even more certainty with uh, an equation of state model and you could just do that uh, on a daily basis. There are commercial tools that does that uh, every single day. You can even get it automated. So. If you have that option, I, I would recommend to to do that. But the correlation should be a good surrogate if you don't uh, if you don't have that option. Thanks very much, Matthias. Okay, well let's let's move on to our uh, our third presenter, and uh, this is uh, Tyler Connor. So Tyler, he's worked as a reservoir engineer at uh, Devon Energy in Oklahoma City for eight years, and he's currently uh, supporting the Rockies business unit. His background is in numerical simulation projects and developing training programs focused on rate transient analysis. Tyler actually grew up in Saudi Arabia uh, under the oil and gas umbrella, and the industry has always been his passion. Tyler studies chemical engineering at the University of Utah, completing both an undergrad and master's degree. Uh, before he joined the Rockies team, he worked in Eagleford and Delaware Basin as a simulation and asset engineer. Tyler is very active and passionate about the SPE, and he served on his local section board for many years, including the section share, uh, chair. Now, one thing you probably don't know about Tyler, but in addition to being a reservoir engineer, he moonlights as an indistingu indistinguishable uh, body double for uh, Harrison Ford. Awesome. All right, Tyler, let's uh, let's hear from you. Can't wait. All right. Thanks again for the introduction, Graham. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. Uh, the title of my talk today is going to be Interpreting Noise and Production Rate Data with Measurement and Management Best Practices. Um, so before I get kicked off, I kind of want to preface uh, my presentation with uh, when John asked me to uh, speak today, um, I was actually on my way to uh, Yosemite out in California, and I was like, sure, sure, John, yeah, whatever you want, um, and we'll figure out the, the to topic later. And so over the weekend, he was texting, uh, like, hey, what do you want to talk about, yada, yada. Well, I had no cell service, so I never got back to him. And so essentially, uh, what we've got here is the uh, machinations of John's imagination, um, and I honestly have no idea what I'm supposed to talk about. So. Uh, in the immortal words of, of uh, Bill O'Reilly, we're going to do it live. Uh, so get, to get us kicked off today, um, I want to talk a little bit about facilities and how they affect our data. Um, there's been a few mentions of it throughout the course of this morning, um, but I, I want to stress the importance of having an understanding of facilities um, and, and where your metering points are. Um, and some of the things that can go wrong. So we'll take we'll look at some examples of water, oil, and gas metering. Um, then we'll take a step over to diagnostics and how uh, the data we collect in the field can sometimes be our friend. Um, we'll take a look at downhole gauges and how that could be used for flowback and artificial lift. And uh, finally, throughout my presentation, it's going to be memes. So uh, you should get a good uh, feel for how they can be used in presentations. So uh, what we've got here, this is just a mock-up of a facility design that we uh, run pretty prevalently here uh, in the Rockies. So um, coming off of our wellhead, we are flowing into a two-phase separator. Uh, from there, our uh, gas is coming off and being metered by an orifice meter heading down, down line. Oil and water is coming off and hitting a three-phase heater treater. Again, gas is coming off. Uh, water uh, heads to our tanks from that heater treater. It is metered by a mag meter. Um, our oil is uh, proceeding to a vapor recovery tower. It is metered by a Coriolis. Uh, again, gas comes off. It is compressed and down line. Um, we have a bypass line from our two phase and the individual uh, um, units to our uh, flare separator and ongoing to our flare. From the recovery tower, our oil is uh, headed to tanks. 
And uh, we also have a recycle pump from the tank back into our heater treater. And this is done to prevent, to make sure we've got good separation between oil and water. We don't want to be sending water down the line um, and getting rejection. Um, so we uh, send it through the heater treater several times. Um, and then once uh, from the tanks, it's headed to the lact for sales. The water heads to pipeline. And as it comes off leads, we meter it with a turbine meter. Um, gas will hit a final sales gas separator. Um, and then it will also proceed to sales uh, and it will be metered um, on the sales side by an orifice meter. And finally, we have a, um, a compressor line for gas lift. Um, and again, that will be metered by an orifice meter. So we'll talk a little bit about, uh, we'll come back to this a few different times throughout the course of the presentation. But So I'm going to start with water. What is it good for? We don't sell it, so it's very often neglected. Um, however, it has uh, uh, implications on our wellbore pressure drop calculations. Uh, Matthias, in his presentation, talked a lot about oil and gas, but um, water um, is often, you know, you have water oil ratios of two, three, five plus um, in many of these basins. So um, many times water is actually our primary fluid that we're producing out of a well. And so it's, it's, it's fundamental to have an understanding of, of that water, the rates that are, we're producing, because um, it can be very diagnostic um, and help us characterize reservoir behavior. Things such as water oil ratios can be used for tight curve generation um, to make sure you're using um, similar, similar wells. Um, and again, water oil ratio can be used to help diagnose fracture drainage areas if, if you notice anomalous um, water oil ratio behavior this could potentially um, indicate that you're producing from multiple formations, for instance. So what's in our water? Uh, it's important to measure specific gravity and salinity. Um, these are uh, fundamental for uh, the calculation of uh, density uh, of your fluids. And as, again, as Matthias mentioned, uh, density is, is by and large the uh, most important parameter when um, calculating uh, flowing pressures from surface rates and pressures. How is your, your water metered? Um, I mentioned a few different ones uh, on our wells. Um, are you metering it off of a separator? Is it while it's coming off lease? Um, and what type of meters are you using? Uh, this is all important to know and for these reasons. Uh, so this is a well in my area. Um, you can see uh, I've got water, oil, and then the calculated sand phase pressures uh, on this plot. So as we're producing the well, you see water falling off, which is not too um, uh, strange for a well and early flow back. You're going to see um, that load water coming off as we unload it. Um, oil is going to be increasing, and you'll see your uh, increasing oil cut. But uh, what we noticed pretty quickly was that our off-lease water was not matching our allocation meter um, off of the separator. And you can see, like here, uh, that was becoming dramatically so. Um, so what was happening was we had um, iron sulfide is, uh, in the water is accumulating on the pipe walls of the meter, and it's distorting the accuracy of that measurement. And what this resulted in is the need for us to uh, regularly um, brush those meters and uh, clean them. And what you can see is that happened. Eventually, we were having to do that multiple times a day. Um, and you can see the corresponding impacts on the water production when we did that. This is the same well. I wanted to show uh, how this affects your actual analyses um, beyond just, hey, here's my rate data and my calculated pressures. Um, this is a square to time plot as we've seen a couple times today. Um, and so I've calculated pressures based off my uh, oil, water, gas rates and with these rates. I'm showing the choke changes. What we can see is as we bump our chokes, you're seeing corresponding change in um, the normalized pressure and as well as an increase, obviously, in our uh, water rate. Um, when we increased again, we saw a much diminished increase in our water rate. So at the same time, we were uh, noticing that our off-lease water wasn't matching our allocation, so we started brushing. What you'll see is that when we did that, we saw an increase of 1,250 barrels um, and then a few days later, we had to do it again and again. It was around 1,250 barrels. 
we bumped the choke and this time around we saw actually a much larger increase in our water production and that's likely due to the, the meters having been cleaned recently. Um, again, brushed it, saw an increase. So this is a different well, but similar issue. Uh, we're looking at dailies here now. Um, and, and you can see um, when we were doing our allocation based off of the separator meter, um, there are several instances where we uh, uh, brushed the meters and you saw a temporary restoration of the, the water rates, but it was short-lived. Um, and so you can implement programs to regularly clean meters, but truthfully, it's, it's not that feasible. Um, there's going to be a lot of wells out there. Um, you're going to be limited by staff. Um, and honestly, if you're needing to do this multiple times a day, like I just showed, you're not going to have somebody out there just sitting there cleaning meters all day. Um, so what we decided to do was um, go to an allocation based off water leaving the lease. So I mentioned that we uh, are metering that with a turbine. We also do some filtration on the water prior to that meter, so that helps remove a lot of that iron sulfide. And so we get a much better uh, handle on our water production. Um, but you can't always do this, or you need to be careful with it. Um, if there's multiple formations at play, um, flowing into a uh, common tank battery, you potentially will have uh, differing water oil ratios. Um, similarly, if uh, you've got multiple wells on a pad and some are uh, like a parent and child, for instance, that parent well will likely have a differing water oil ratio than that um, newer child well. So you need to be careful if you're going to be um, doing this, but I think it is uh, something that we can implement to help us uh, with that data. And then take a look at different metering. Um, you've got you know, Coriolis, Mag, Turbine. Look at filtering. These are all things you can do to um, help you with, with getting a handle on that production data. And honestly, it may not be an issue for some. Like uh, in the Delaware Basin, we didn't have uh, this issue. So if that's the case, do nothing. Uh, we're going to take one last look at this well and what you can do with the data you have at hand. Um, so obviously, I didn't want this choppy noise uh, in my analysis. So what I decided to do is set a decline through the production points that I had faith in um, and generate some pseudo rates. And then with those rates, I generated a new, I recalculated my pressures. And you can see that those are much, much smoother now. Um, you could also use water oil ratio, but again, during cleanup with that water oil ratio is changing, uh, this could be very difficult. Um, but just in terms of how that looks in the analysis, here's our original with the uh, choppy, uh, um, the choppy water rate data, and then here is it based on the uh, pseudo rates. So you can see it's much smoother, and uh, diagnostically you can look at impacts of choke on productivity. So moving into gas, some things you need to consider is, are you flaring? Um, if you are, are you metering that flare? I remember examples um, from the 2014-2015 vintage where uh, meter, metering our gas flare wasn't a high priority, and you had examples of where you had no gas data for potentially months before you could get pipeline out there um, and um, get it hooked up to sale. So in, in that case, you have no data whatsoever. Um, where are your metering points? Is it coming off the separator, um, or is it only at the sales end? Are you metering your injected volumes? If you're uh, circulating gas for gas lift or buying back gas for uh, injection, um, are you metering that? Um, and then what volumes are you actually physically seeing in your office? Is it net? Is it gross? Um, are they separator volumes or um, sales? So here's an example looking at gas. Um, you, can, you can pretty easily see at the beginning, uh, we've got some anomalous gas rate data. And what we found was that there was a system update that caused our sales and allocation meters to be additive. So these two are getting added together. And so essentially we're doubling our gas volumes. So we managed to get that fixed and you can see the gas comes back down. But then pretty soon after uh, it starts increasing again, you might think to yourself, is this my, my bubble point if I cross my saturation pressure? Well, we have a gauge on the, a downhole gauge on the well and a nearby, uh, a PVT from a nearby well. Um, so we have our saturation pressure of about 2560. Based on our gauge, we're flowing at 2800. 
So it's not inconceivable that, yeah, we might be um, crossing our, our saturation pressure, um, but that doesn't really explain this precipitous drop in the gauge pressure when we see that rate. Um, so I also knew that we recently started lifting this well, and so we brought in the gas lift injection volumes. And sure enough, when we started injecting gas, you see that increase in our uh, reported gas rates as well as um, that drop in pressure. So what it comes down to is this first metering point off of our two-phase separator was the gas we were seeing. Those are gross volumes that it's reading. Um, so it's taking into account, obviously, our injected and produced volumes. So fortunately, we had a uh, orifice meter on our injection line, um, so we were able to pretty easily net out those um, injected volumes. And what you can see is that makes a much more consistent gas profile. So moving into oil metering, um, fortunately, it's not as prone to errors as gas and water, uh, in my experience. And for the simple reason of this is our, you know, what we're selling uh, for the most part. Um, so we, we are a lot more uh, careful about how we meter it and, and making sure we're getting paid properly. But still, there's still many considerations you need to look at. Um, but Matthias mentioned it, looking at separator versus sales volumes um, or hourly versus daily. Um, hourly has a lot of benefits. It's also often got a lot of noise in it. Um, daily, you can often have tr issues with allocation, particularly if you've got multiple formations flowing into common batteries. Um, so again, just an understanding your facilities is very, very crucial. Uh, in this example, um, we're, uh, you, you can see this anomalous behavior in, in the, the rate data, and I don't have the choke um, plotted here, but um, it's flat through this time. What, this isn't resulted from a, a choke back and then an open. Um, so did some digging, and what we found was is that if you remember earlier, I mentioned that we had this recycle pump uh, from our tank into our heater treater. Well, we were metering this data um, subsequent to that heater treater, so we were actually seeing recycled volumes uh, when that pump was running. Um, and so we actually, this was actually a time period when uh, the pump was actually being replaced. So that was the true rate profile through here. Unfortunately, on this uh, well, we did not have a recycle uh, meter from that pump to the, uh, to the heater treater. So we had to come up with some uh, tricky methods to try to net out those additional volumes. And what we did was is we have data on when that pump is on and off. Um, so we were able to use that to essentially ignore um, the period before and a little bit after, uh, or sorry, after and a little bit before the uh, pump is running um, to try to um, remove some of those recycled volumes. And you can see it worked relatively well. It's not a perfect solution by any means. Um, so our go forward decision was to, um, for any of the wells that were associated with a recycled pump, we would install a meter on those, and uh, th that's really helped clear up our issues with that recycled pump. So just maybe talk about some diagnostics uh, pretty quickly. Um, this was a, a well we recently had come online, and uh, we had a, a downhole gauge on it as well as uh, everything hooked up in SCADA, so we were seeing this, this data real time. And uh, one morning, we noticed that the, the pressure was, the downhole pressure was starting to increase. Um, and so we get to the office and we have a 7, a, uh, 7 a.m. call with the field uh, every morning. And so talking with them about this, they go out to the well and um, found this rock in the choke. Um, so they were able to clear that obstruction. You can see our pressure start falling off again. Um, that corresponded to about a 50 barrel a day drop in production over that period, uh, it likely would have increased more if, if we hadn't uh, um, been paying attention. Um, so it, yeah, if left undiagnosed, this will appear as a productivity loss in any uh, rate transient analysis. And more importantly, it can lead to further operational issues. Um, if you let that stuff build up, you, you're going to end up having to tear apart your chokes. 
um, choking back your well um, and clean, cleaning that out. So that's not something you're going to want to have to do on a, on a frequent basis. I'll give you about a five minutes head up, heads up here, Tyler. All right. Thanks, Graham. Um, another example, this is actually the same well, um, and we decided we wanted to uh, kick off uh, gas lift a bit earlier than we normally would. Uh, so we're going to kick it off right around 700 pounds tubing pressure. And uh, this was mostly to prevent, uh, if you remember on the, the previous well example, when we kicked off gas lift, you saw that precipitous drop in the um, downhole pressure data. What we wanted to avoid that we wanted a more smooth um, fall off transition. So kicked it off. Uh, what you'll immediately notice is that our water rates increased, our oil rates decreased. So it was kind of scratched our head for a little bit um, until we realized essentially we're just unloading the backside water into the tubing. Um, but additionally, so when you, when you did that, you also saw the corresponding increase in that uh, gauge pressure down hole. But we also started building surface pressure um, at, through our injection. And essentially, we were creating a pressure baffle um, between downhole and the surface. And you can see that that resulted in a much shallower decline of that pressure, which is the opposite of what we're trying to do. Um, so the decision was made that we were going to shut off gas lift, wait till lower tubing head pressure. And you can see when we did that, um, that uh, downhole pressure started to fall again. So one final example of how you can use uh, you know, downhole gauges, for instance, to help diagnose and um, issues and uh, optimize artificial lift. So again, this is the same well. What we've got here is uh, my gauge depth pressure and then that corrected to sand face. So this is set a few hundred foot above uh, sand face. Excuse me. And uh, but what I wanted to do was compare our pressure drop correlations to the gauge pressures to see if there's, uh, for this fluid window, is there a particular um, uh, correlation, bottom of flowing pressure correlation that uh, does better than the others or one we should totally avoid. Um, so I know what my uh, gas of design was. Um, I have the the depths and the closed pressures that those um, are at. And so what I did was I went in and I built, uh, I looked at when my, my casing head pressures reached these thresholds and I essentially built a, a new wellbore schematic at each one of these. Um, and then I used my surface rates and pressures to calculate that downhole pressure. You can see as early on, we're matching really well. Uh, we kick off gas lift, we start seeing some deviation from um, uh, what were our calculated sand phase pressure from the gauge. Um, but the really interesting thing is, is that we end up actually below our gauge pressure. If, uh, based on our casing head pressure, we're supposed to be injecting the valve for it. Um, it actually predicts a pressure lower than our, our gauge, which is set higher in the well. So I was like, all right, well, what if we're only injecting into gauge six? Um, that's at 7,000 foot T. And that gets us closer. It puts us essentially at where the gauge is reading. Um, so again, I went up, all right, how about valve eight? So that's set at 5,500 foot. And what you see is that's matching right in line with where our calculated pressure was. So um, spoke with, we, we use this as a, as a methodology for evaluating um, our gas lift design and if uh, we needed to make any changes. So just run through some conclusions real quick. Data can be your friend if you let it. Um, again, I'm going to thump the table and say understand your facilities, uh, how your data is, is gathered. Um, if you don't know uh, or care, nobody else is. Employ tools that can help you aid in diagnostics. Um, downhole gauges are a huge benefit to any engineer, um, particularly if you're going to be performing great transient analyses. Uh, it takes a lot of the question marks out of analysis. Um, you can use it for pressure interference testing between wells, um, artificial lift optimization, um, checking your correlations, um, and then meters. Understand where they are, uh, what kind they are. Are they prone to issues with fouling or uh, things we mentioned uh, before? 
and then talk with people in the field and uh, other engineers in your office, your facilities engineers, your production engineers, um, your reservoir guys. Um, and I found with this last project, talking with the field uh, on a daily basis, you learn way more about what's going on with the well and uh, how that affects the data coming to the office than you know, just looking at emails or anything like that. Uh, so I encourage you to, to make a habit of that. And then my, my last point is trust nothing. Uh, don't take it for granted that the data you have is, is worth a damn. Um, prove it to yourself and make sure that uh, what you're getting at the office uh, and you, using for your analyses uh, is actually representative of the reservoir and the performance of the well. And finally, my no presentation by me would be complete without a uh, Star Wars meme. So, uh, if this was not the presentation you were looking or hoping for, uh, blame, blame John Thompson. So with that, I'll open it for questions. Tyler, thanks a lot. This was really, um, really practical. I appreciate all the specific cases you used. Um, everything you talked about reminded me of a quote from Louis Matar, and it's that if you torture data long enough, it will confess to anything. Okay, so I think the really theme of your talk was that it's really worth it to spend some time up front looking at your reported volumes and pressures because that's going to save you a ton of frustration once you get into RTA. Yes, definitely. I mean, I would, I mean, honestly, before going into RTA or modeling efforts of any kind, um, I would, I would certainly recommend you sp spend, you know, at least a couple of hours, if not a day, like running through your data and understanding like its genesis and um, if there's any issues you need to be concerned about because you can start chasing, you know, going down rabbit holes trying to chase performance that may not actually exist. Um, so yeah, definitely. Awesome. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give one question and this is really open to any, any panelists. Um, it's about uh, liquid loading. So instead of using Turner and Coleman, um, have we seen any success instead using data data analytics to understand and predict liquid loading? Does anyone have any comments on that? I don't like gas wells, so I don't worry about liquid loading. <laughs> yeah, so I, if by data analytics we're, we're referring to kind of machine learning or um, some of the more advanced techniques um, I haven't experienced them using. Typically, we just rely on uh, Turner Coleman, but we are incorporating some additional features such as we don't just rely on wellhead pressures and a calculation of gas density there. We tend to use a multi-phase flow correlation and calculate densities along the well bore and primarily look at what the critical velocity is downhole where pressures are higher. Um, but we also do use tools such as spot fire and anything that can help us interpret the data and visualize it in a way that that's helpful. So we, we can um, plot these in sort of data analytical software packages like spot fire, which can help. But the, the reference to data analytics sometimes throws me off. I don't know specifically what people, what people are referring to. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we still typically as production engineers, especially rely on Turner Coleman and then fudge factors or adjustments as needed. Once we know roughly where a well will start loading, and we look at its relationship to Turner or Coleman and say, okay, that was off by 20%. Let's just adjust it and use that as the new point going forward. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, um, I think we're going to move on to our final presenter and, um, you know, there are a few other outstanding questions, but we'll, we'll give people more time to submit them and, Again, for our audience, make sure you find the Q&A panel and, uh, and go ahead and ask anything you want as we, as we present here. So I'll just introduce our next presenter here. Okay, so, so John Thompson is our, our final presenter here. And John is the co-founder and president of Sago Wisdom, which is a technology company specializing in practical on the job training for the oil and gas industry. 
Now for John over the past years, he's been better known as a reservoir engineer and an instructor for rate transient analysis, specializing in unconventional reservoirs. Now from all this experience, John has analyzed thousands of hydraulically fractured wells spanning all the major shale plays in US, Canada, Argentina. And his work has provided a lot of insight into production forecasting, stimulation effectiveness, uh, and well spacing and completion optimization, um, as well as really just diagnosing untapped production potential. John has co-authored uh, or authored uh, 19 papers on well performance, and he regularly serves the SP uh, as a pr program committee member for conferences and unconventional resources. Um, now, one thing I know if you've ever met John, you'll know how passionate he is about the industry. Uh, and of course, also you know that he loves to have fun. So with that, John, can't wait to hear your talk. Thank you so much, Mr. Halprick. Um, and thanks so much to all the attendees and to all the panelists, um, all the fellows who gathered to, to provide these talks. I really appreciate that. I'm going to start before I get into my slide deck showing off uh, my new t-shirt that I wanted to show everybody. You might recognize the face, I pardon the glare, but there's Mr. Blassingame saying that rate transient analysis is the only proven reservoir evaluation tool for unconventionals, which any of you who tuned in to the virtual ERTEC program this year and actually heard Mr. Blassingame give that talk it was on a loop that kept going over and over and over and over again because they were having technical misfire. And he just kept saying that line over and over again. So I loved it so much, I put it on a t-shirt. So that's how I'm gonna start this talk. Now I'm gonna see if I can slide, share my deck. All right, my talk is entitled Linear Flow Specialized Analysis, Unloading Opportunities from Positive Intercepts. And there's a teaser at the end to talk a little bit about negative intercepts. And the quid pro quo, Mr. Helfrich, um, if you're going to talk about me, I'll talk about you. Here's some things that you guys probably didn't know. Um, at, when uh, Graham Helfrich, at the ripe age of 12 years old, his parents thought he was a troublemaker. They shipped him off to boarding school in northern Canada to be reformed. And one of the results of this rigorous outdoor program is that he lost his big toe <laughs> to frostbite during a three-night uh, dog sled trip in minus 40 Celsius. And you can see See him there on that rock face right over there. A couple more little tidbits for you. Uh, when he was 18 years old, he was unemployed looking for a job. He didn't find anything that would pay him any money, but he ended up in a Bollywood movie as an extra in this movie called The Hero. So he fully expects he's got a lot of cheering fans in India. And more recently, he's just become a new dad. So as you can see from the picture here, he's learned how to multitask. And if you look at his little baby's eyes there, I think that expression is absolutely priceless. So I had to include it. So the introduction to my talk really is this. Uh, early time well-performance data often exhibits, it often exhibits skin damage or positive intercepts that you might see on a square root time plot. Now the question is, is that positive intercept a damage term? Is it related to the formation or the fracture system? Or is it a pressure loss term that could be occurring in the well bore? Uh, for example, could it be liquid loading? And I think it, it's you, like it happens all throughout industry that engineers are drawing straight lines through square root time plots and they're thinking, oh, this well is damaged. But no, this is a well that might be choked or it needs tubing or it needs a pump. Uh, something is, it, it's liquids. And the problem with that, of course, is uh, a false uh, characterization of what's going on can really lead you as, as, astray, which I'll get into later uh, through the case studies that I'll present. The first being on the back of Muerta, shale, uh, shale gas well, a really old well that um, part of the original, uh, when, the, when the play was being developed, was one of the earlier ones. Uh, this is an example that I featured in my last webinar, uh, which was RTA, PTA in a, in a shut-in environment. For those of you that tuned in, I want to say that was in May. Uh, then I'll get into a Turner formation well. This is a tight oil well um, that's also going to talk about um, not loading, but maybe other causes that can be causing positive intercepts. Uh, the tools that are gonna be featured in this talk are all from IHS Harmony Enterprise. Uh, in fact, I'm using some of the old Harmony as well. Uh, we call it the red version, but linear flow specialized plots. So that's encompassing all of them, square root time, material balance, square root time, linear superposition time. People often ask, what's, your, what's the best one? Well, it depends what your objectives are. 
Um, they're very fit for purpose. There's no silver bullet here. Uh, or, and uh, the next two things that I feature are the models. So an analytical model or a numerical hybrid production model, which of course is becoming very popular these days. Uh, at the end, I'll talk a little bit about uh, negative intercepts. So if positive represents potential uplift opportunity from unloading wells, what about the negative ones? Uh, we do see those sometimes, particularly for the higher permeability uh, plays or systems that are exploited using multi-fract horizontals. We're going to talk about that. Um, uh, I'll be referencing a paper that I authored back in 2012 that really talk about compound linear flow type curves and what negative intercepts can mean as a proxy for stimulation effectiveness or completion effectiveness. So I, I grabbed this image just yesterday because it made me laugh. Um, we all know that Vaca Muerta means dead cow. Well, here's Vacas Muertas. <laughs> 23 cows in Texas lined up to a metal fence and it got hit by lightning and the farmer shows up and there was 23 dead cows in a row. Um, anyway, that got me, uh, that was quite the article. That was from last year. Uh, so this is the uh, Vaca Muerta example um, visualized using a linear flow specialized plot using linear superposition time. Uh, this is the, the exact example, the exact slide that I showed from my last webinar talk. And you can see as the choke is opening here, 864 choke, 1064, you can see some features going on. This example shows how a simple RTA diagnostic plot can provide valuable insight to a production engineer. So what's happening here? Well, there's two distinct well performance phenomena that are present here. As the choke is progressively increased, it allows for more flow. The apparent skin, as you can see in early time, is reduced, as evidenced by the reduction in the positive intercept. This likely in, in, um, indicates the removal of stagnant wick, uh, liquids as gas velocity is successively increased as the choke is opened. But there's something else going on. As the choke size is progressively increased, you see the slope changing. The A root K is being reduced. The line is getting steeper. This indicates uh, the well productivity as measured by the frac area in the perm. It's sensitive to drawdown. And we expect this in overpressured stress sensitive formations of which the vacuum muerta is certainly one. Poor pressure gradient out there is like 0.9 PSI per foot, very Haynesville-like. Um, without this simple diagnostic tool, it would be very difficult to properly quantify the very complex deliverability relationship for this well. An IPR curve based on the initial production on the 864th, for example, wouldn't yield a very viable mid to long-term production forecast. The engineer would be history matching it with low FCD values or high skin terms, and they would probably be using higher permeability than they should have. They'd be totally going um, off in the wrong direction. So what I didn't show in the last webinar is this very important plot, which is the liquid loading diagnostic plot. And here in red, we have our gas rates relative to the black line here, which uh, happens to be the Coleman rate. The Turner rate would be um, a little higher, about 25% higher. You can see as the choke is getting opened on this date in particular, on the 19th of October, we start to breach the threshold of the Coleman rate. So now this indicates a time when we should start to be unloading any stagnant or trapped liquids located in the well that could be falsely uh, manifesting itself as a skin term. Uh, also of note, I should mention, I've shown the wellbore schematic here. Take a look at this. This is a gas well that has two and seven eighths inch tubing, not two and three eighths inch tubing. So you've got a bigger ID the, uh, the tubing string isn't landed into the, the bottom of the well. It's fairly high up in the vertical section. This is a well that doesn't take too much to load, and that's why the, the early half year of production rates are uh, unsurprisingly below liquid loading. Uh, sorry, are below critical rate so that they are liquid loading. Um, the next step in the RTA workflow would be to create a model that captures the observed well performance behavior. Now this gap that I'm showing here that where I'm showing a 500 PSI difference, delta P between where the model's response on the pressure, where the model's telling us it wants to be and where the calculated pressures are, the, that gap is most likely due to a column of stagnant liquid at the bottom of the well. Later, when the choke is opened, some of that pressure loss is removed and the history match is restored. So when you are history matching uh, 
uh, wells, like this is not an uncommon um, feature. Um, and there's a very clear explanation as to why. That date of October 19th, where we started clearing Coleman, you can see is right here. So there's a lot of consistency between the diagnostic plot and the model. Um, I'm now going to show you, I'm going to run a quick video where I walk through uh, the, the Harmony workflow. Well, this is the analytical model, specifically within the RTA application. Uh, we're going to try something new that hasn't been done before. What I'm going to demonstrate is try to match the uh, like liquid loaded data points through time and have the model go through those points. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna treat those points as if it was skin damage, because really what I'm gonna do is just create a pressure loss term. It doesn't matter if it's FCD or skin or just some Delta P. I'm gonna make sure my model goes through those points. And then I'm gonna play a what if scenario about removing that pressure loss term to see what the performance uplift could be at that well right away if we unloaded it. A production engineer might wanna know the economics of, hey, I know it's loaded. I don't know how much it's loaded, but what if I unloaded it? Like what if uh, I put it on pump or lower tubing or, or did an intervention? What is my benefit? What's like for the same flowing pressure or the same like drawdown, what's my rate gonna jump up to? So this is a workflow where I'm gonna try to demonstrate that. So here I can, I'm demonstrating the gap between the model and the pressure. I'm gonna approximate that by lowering the FCD to one, which is putting in that pressure loss term caused by loading. So now I'm capturing just that section of the data. Then I'm going to try to start, I'm gonna forecast the well from the beginning of the history. And this is where I play the what if simulation exercise. I'll ramp the pressures down for a few months, trying to capture the trend in the field data my first guess is down here, as you can see, and this is what the synthetic gas rate response would be. So that was too low, this is too high, and now I'm too low. And now you can see with this last one, the model's response for gas rate is approximating the flowing pressure profile. Now that it's matched, I'll remove that skin term or the pressure loss term and say, this is what the well might look like if it was unloaded. So it's kind of a tricky way of using a model to calculate the, um, the accelerated, the, the, the kick in rate and the sustained kick in rate uh, with removal of that term. So anyway, I thought that would be something different. Um, now moving on to the Turner formation, the Tina Turner case study, uh, what's choke size got to do with it. Um, this is a Turner well. Um, what you should know about the Turner, it's a tight oil play uh, it's high permeability in my world. Uh, usually we're talking nano Darcy plays with Eagleford and Niall Brera and all these ultra tight rocks. This isn't that tight. Core studies usually kick this thing out anywhere between four and 20 micro Darcy's. Um, like I said, that's, that's good perm in my world. And this particular well was the operator pumped it with 100%, 100 mesh propent which kind of surprised me as an RE. Um, I wouldn't have thought that you'd pump a well with 100 mesh that's on the higher side for perm because it's all about conductivity contrast between matrix and fractures, right? If it's really, really tight, 100 mesh is enough of a contrast to make something conductive. If it gets closer to conventional permeability, you usually need the cracks to be uh, propped with bigger materials. So this may come up later, uh, spoiler alert, in, in this talk. Um, you could ask why 100 mesh? Well, it's like buying at the bulk farm. The operator gets a pretty good price on it. It carries through pipe and it gets delivered in the formation pretty easily uh, without things settling and without pressure loss. And there's minimal perf erosion. So there's benefits other than cost for going 100 mesh. But anyway, the, the disadvantage again is that whole conductivity contrast. Um, all right, so you can see there's lots of step changes in the data too. That's gonna to be some chokes opening. So this is the same production data looking at oil uh, on a square root time plot. And you can see all the various choke changes and you can see several uh, through time. 
The question is, is that initial intercept that we're seeing on the 18 inch choke, which is how it starts, is that due to liquid loading or is that something else? Um, a better plot, another way of looking at this or to add to the previous plot, because we still have the same data series on there. Sometimes I like to visualize it with the changing chokes right on the screen, which is the magenta line here and the water rates and the water oil ratio. So all of this is presented on the plot so we can start to take a look at why things are happening and we can watch the well clean up as we're doing it. Um, the, a better plot for early time reservoir characterization uses the linear superposition time function on the x-axis in place of the square root time. It's useful in that it superposes all those transients that get introduced following operating condition changes. And you saw those choke changes. So it superposes all that stuff. What's the benefit? It makes the interpretation of the data less subjective. Uh, it creates all these nice parallel straight lines. Um, and that makes it a lot easier for an engineer to interpret because straight lines are a lot easier than this nightmarish thing on the square root time plot. So there's a line. There's a line, there's a line, they all have the exact same slope and they can all extrapolate back to the y-intercept. So let's take an expanded view on early time and I'm gonna take this and magnify it and we're gonna take a look at it again. So there's the 18 inch choke, there's the 20, there's the 22nd, there's the 24th. And if you go way further ahead in time and you get all the way up till you're open up to the biggest choke setting, which was 44, it could be extrapolated right back to the intercept, which I'll show you more clearly in the next plot where you can see it connect. So zooming into the early data, we see a clear trend, don't we? We see uh, a reduction in the positive intercept as the choke is opened. Does that look familiar? Sound like the previous example a bit? Well, this time the reason appears to be different. It's an oil well, it's not a gas well liquid loading. The opening of the choke is commensurate with the well cleaning up rather than unloading the stagnant liquids, which is why I was showing you all that cleanup in the water rates and the water to oil ratio. Um, once open to the 44 choke, this is taking a look at all the data, as I mentioned, that straight line could be brought right through the origin. And I'm gonna use the terms perhaps falsely indicating that it's infinite acting linear flow with infinite fracture conductivity. That's one possible interpretation, but What's, but remember, this is all single phase flow, right? I'm, uh, in terms of the analytical analysis, this is oil. This isn't multi-phase yet, number one. Number two, I haven't modeled it yet using a numerical model. This is a highly multi-phase system. We got lots of gas and oil and water, lots of water. So is this the right diagnostic plot? Is this the right approach? I'm showing you this because this is my actual workflow, looking through the well. This is how I started. And as I had these discoveries, I wanted to show you the whole story of how I originally went through this well example. So is all this junk at the beginning, is that unloading wells or is that a relative permeability effect during cleanup? Well, using the Harmony Enterprise software, the latest version, um, diagnostically, when you turn on multi-phase, this is what the plot looks like. Man, is that a lot cleaner, isn't it? From this, to that. Okay, so multi-phase, there's something going on here. Now this particular plot is a strong function of like my assumption of the drainage volume or drainage area. It changes the slope, it changes the A root K. Um, you know, uh, James Ewart uh, and maybe even James McDonald have presented workflows about best practices of using multi-phase flowing material balance analysis to synchronize these things. I don't wanna get into that. I just wanna show you clearly that there's a very big diagnostic difference in, in using these um, multi-phase corrected analytical solutions. Um, and the, the research group that's really leading the way in that field of uh, research is Dr. Chris Clarkson and his team at the University of Calgary. Um, so moving on, uh, an alternative model, or I should say the next step is to use the model. This is a numerical hybrid production model to confirm the interpretation from analysis. True to the original diagnostic, this model indicates an initial pressure loss gap right here. Um, in, in that the pressure trends, like 
like the, the early pressures don't match, the, the model's pressures doesn't match the, the calculated values, or in this case, it's actually got a gauge at the bottom of the well. So that gap is what I'm saying could be uh, influenced by multi-phase. The model doesn't understand that there's a whole bunch of flowback water in there. Uh, this particular model doesn't introduce the frac load. So that, that could be a good explanation of why there's such a big gap. Um, and so that would be the potential discrepancy. But notice that it does capture the trend during late time, but what it's not doing a good job of capturing the texture. Do you see all these little pressure spikes? Not doing a good job with an infinite frac conductivity model. I'm purposely not showing you all the reservoir description detail because I, I don't want to get into the minutia of, of the description. So an alternative model is presented here, one that uses a low fracture conductivity term, and it obtains a much better match of the data. And it also doesn't require as much apparent skin removal in early time. As you can see here, um, this isn't as much of a gap, it cleans up a lot earlier, and now we're matching all the texture. Now, that makes a whole lot of sense to me because again, we're pumping 100 mesh into something that's tens of microdarcies or thereabouts. Um, and so I would fully expect with that profit selection to have a low FCD term. And of course the model does support that type of an interpretation. Now, maybe that's okay. Um, you know, low FCD also means it's, it's almost like a downhole choke in your reservoir, um, you know, right at the fracture interface. And that could be good because it doesn't allow you to impose high effective stress on a well when you're trying to draw on it. And maybe that results in uh, fractures that are effective longer at greater distances and more area. That's maybe not a bad thing. And maybe it's all about economics. So that's okay. But certainly this comparison view of the infinite conductivity model versus the one with low FCD, I, I certainly would favor this description. Now, in speaking to the operator, these um, the chokes were getting cleaned, and so maybe it's not important to be matching these little spikes, but these are things that, uh, as Tyler Connor said, you wanna be talking to your field personnel. You don't wanna be looking at an office and just assuming that all the data is right. You wanna challenge the data every step of the way so that you can um, more uniquely understand the, the reservoir description or more confidently understand it, I should say. So now what about negative intercepts? Well, as I mentioned, if positive intercepts are uplift potential, negative intercepts are also a good thing, um, which maybe is counterintuitive, but for semi, like I mentioned before at the beginning of the talk, for plays that have higher perm that sequence through the flow regimes more quickly for a multifract horizontal well, um, especially those that are getting into the 0.1 millidarcy territory, what ends up happening when you look at daily production data is you go right through all the early flow regimes and you start transitioning right towards uh, this compound linear flow, this late linear flow that you hear lots about. Um, and that's really where there's a lot of uh, application from what I'm about to show you now. What is a good proxy for stimulation effectiveness? Well, for me, it's lots of fractures that are really long. So the fracture spacing goes less, the fractures get longer, and that's pretty good. That's what we're looking for. So if we look at the um, unit cell here, or unit of symmetry, you can see XE is the distance to the next frac, and XF is the fracture half length, of course. Well, if fracture spacings decrease, the numerator goes down, and the ratio goes down. If the frac length gets bigger, denominator gets bigger, the ratio goes down. So we want to have the most stimulated well, the most effective completion. You want that ratio to be low. Well, I'm gonna show you what that looks like on dimensionless um, compound linear flow type curve plots. Usually we think of type curves as log log plots where the type curves are dimensionless representations of reservoir descriptions. Well, you can do that with Cartesian coordinate specialized plots. It doesn't have to be a log log plot. And this is the math um, that re was reorganized to express the fracture area for compound linear flow. Uh, or the late linear flow, these red lines towards the well. We won't need to get into the math. It's presented in that paper that I just showed you. This is the visual of the type curves. Here, each uh, series on the left, you can see the, uh, a focus on late time 
for the compound linear flow type curves. And on the right-hand side is an expanded view of what's going on in the bottom left-hand corner of the left plot. So we can really get a look at things. But what we can see is these XE over XF ratios, they're going lower or it's becoming like more effectively stimulated as we go up. Um, if you take those straight lines and extrapolate that straight line, you'll see that you're getting into negative intercept territory, which is clearly shown on the right-hand plot here. And you can see the most stimulated case has, when you, when you enter compound linear, you get into the most negative intercept territory. Uh, the, the beauty of this, what I really like about it is that if you know your fracture spacing or your XE term, and you know that your data is sitting on one of these type curves, you've just solved for XF. You know, with early linear flow, you've got A root K, you can't decouple the geology from the stimulation, right? You can't take the area and the perm terms apart. Well, you can with this one, you can uniquely solve for fracture half length. Uh, which makes it very, very powerful in that. Um, all right, so that's it for my talk. Um, I have one last deep thought. I like ending with deep thoughts. This is going to be a thing that I do. So my deep thought is if you go to a costume party on Halloween, I think a funny outfit would be to dress as a well bore with a steel spike choker around your neck. When you start to feel sick from drinking too much of the special punch, you could rip off your choker and blow chunks through your wellhead. Thank you very much. <laughs> cool. We've got a few questions. By the way, I did laugh at your uh, your cow slide. So I, I know everyone's muted, but I'm sure people were chuckling. I apologize for people that are offended by dead cows, but I liked it. Um, so just before we jump into the questions, I want to ask your, your opinion on something, John. You know. Everyone suffers from choke changes when it comes to looking for a straight line, right? It really upsets the interpretation. Um, you know, with Fekovic, right? We've got that reinitialization feature, which I like. Do you think it would be good to apply that to a square root time plot? Uh, a reinitialized on square root time? Yeah, like anytime there's a, there's a choke change. Yeah, I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I mean, the linear superposition time like already does that very, very well. In fact, it's, it's, it's my preferred time function over material balance square root time mm -hmm. for that particular um, application. Yeah, Mainly it's like because, a hammer. <laughs> like, well, the first, let, let's face it, all fractured wells, the first observable flow regime we should see on anything tight and, bro and fractured with daily production data should be linear flow. It's a fairly safe assumption at the very beginning to assume that. Um, maybe not months into the production with a high perm system, but I think you're okay if you're characterizing slope changes when chokes are rapidly changing the early days and weeks of production. So I think that's safe. Um, could you do a reinitialize things on square root times? I haven't seen that. Sounds interesting. Um, like, like the Fetkovich work that you've talked about. Sure, but I, I've already got a good tool and it works great. So I probably wouldn't do it. All right. um, the, the one benefit I think Brian Miner mentioned in his is it's chronological. And I know a lot of operators really like moving left to right in chronological time and linear superposition doesn't do that for you. But uh, it's easy to put annotation arrows on the data points and on those sections of data to know exactly where you are with respect to time. It doesn't take that much. It's not that hard. So um, anyway. OK, cool. Um, here's a question from the audience. It says, how much can you push the analysis when you don't measure the bottom hole pressure? And what they're talking about is, you know, using surface pressures and correlations in terms of trusting the slope, the slope that you're seeing. Yeah, okay. Well, in, in the last example, I showed you it was a downhole gauge. Um, but, and, and from Matthias Carlson's talk, uh, you know, correlations generally speaking with, with most systems uh, in unconventionals, uh, particularly the ultra tight reservoirs, minus those critical liquid gas condensate ones, it does a pretty good job. So in my experience of doing this every day for a dozen years is that it does a pretty good job. So I, I, I guess I'm, I'm totally satisfied with small inaccuracies and in bottom hole pressure, particularly if you're a high percentage drawdown. This is, an, this is a key, the key point here is that inaccuracies in PWF during low percentage drawdown can cause you go really astray based on where you sit on the IPR curve. 
you can have way off on permeabilities when you're history matching or fracture areas. But when you're really high percentage drawdown and the well's been on for a couple of years, if you're off on pressure a little bit, it's insensitive. And that's just the nature of the shape of an IPR curve. So it really, I guess I would, I would respond and say, what are you trying to figure out? And, mm -hmm. you know, are you trying to do forecasting reserves? Are you trying to characterize early time? What, what are you trying to figure out? And like someone else presented, you can do a sensitivity on the, on the highest and lowest possible bottom hole flowing pressure to see what that has for an outcome. That's a great, yeah, absolutely. If there's uncertainty, you can test mm -hmm. the limits of that for sure. Yeah, right, I'd like to chime in real, real quick as well. Uh, I've actually done this exact exercise looking at how those, uh, those square root of time slopes compare when calculating the pressures from surface rates as well as using the downhole pressure gauge that we had on it. What you'll find is like early in the life of the well, when it's primarily a uh, two-phase flow, you know, on an oil well anyways, uh, before you break, start breaking out large volumes of gas, most of the correlations are going to give you spot on pressure calculations. It's really only later, like once you drop below saturation pressure and you start flowing a lot of gas that you're, um, that those, that those uh, two phase correlations really start to break apart. So, I mean, but early time is when you're developing that slope. So what I found is that there's very, very little difference um, provided, you know, you've done your homework on your um, property calculations in terms of density and all that. Um, that you'll match that downhole gauge pressure very closely and correspondingly be matching the slopes very closely as well. Great. Okay, this next question is to John. Uh, the fracture, fracture characterization would require a lot more input from other disciplines, geomanic, geomechanics from rock properties and prop and types. So how do you account for uncertainties in your fracture model? Yeah, well, nothing beats uh, reservoir monitoring and diagnostic tools to tell you what's going on first and foremost. Um, they're measuring things in the field is always more reliable than a model. Um, obviously, this isn't the way the world was 10 years ago when you're an RTA guy and you just use RTA in a silo. Um, the whole purpose of RTA now to be realized is that it is the cornerstone of an integrated reservoir study. As Blassen Game said, it's the only proven reservoir evaluation tool for unconventionals. And while you may disagree with that, it's not that the tool stands by itself independent of laboratory and field tests. No, it is, it unifies that information. So as you showed, in, as I showed in the Turner example, there was core done. Um, there's measurements in core, there's defects, um, there's fiber measurements, there's, you know, microseismic, there's there's a whole suite of information and disparate sources of oil field data that need to come together cohesively to sort of like hone in on what we believe the reservoir description to look like. It is not, in my experience, absolutely critical to have all the little like, like discrete fracture network model and that kind of complexity. In my experience, that's that level of sophistication is also unreliable <laughs> as proved by diagnostic tools. But to say that we want to bring them all in together and have those influence how we're building our very non-unique reservoir descriptions when we're matching field data, yeah, like of course we want to bring those things in. The, the ones that I value the most, just to tell you, is core under confining pressure, right? Um, not just at atmospheric conditions and um, I, I like my defects. Um, I, I like a frac models if they're calibrated to fiber first, meaning strain hits, so that I can now use my model more reliably. These are, um, these are some of the sources of information I like to ask the operator for before I jump into RTA. Great, um, maybe John, for, for, for you, John and Tyler, um, since these models are non-unique, do you, do you leverage the risk analysis part with RTA or is that not something you guys do often? I, I do a poor man's usually. Mm -hmm. um, by poor man's, I mean, I'll draw a series of deterministic descriptions to capture the high and the low and the most likely and the most likely being the one that's connected to all the other lab and field test uh, data and information that I have. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there are tools to do full risk and full probabilistic approaches. In my experience, um, I find those too time consuming 
I, I just don't have the time to sit there and let those things run as long as, yeah. particularly the ones in the multi-phase environment where there's like five years of data, there's all three phases, uh, the hybrid model, uh, while it can do that is not very fast. So it, it certainly, I'm all for people doing it, but in my life, I've got to keep moving. So I, I like doing it deterministically. Great. Um, next question. What do you, what do you think about initial pressure for when you do RTA? Where do you get that initial pressure from? Um, generally speaking, a defit. Um, mm -hmm. Defits are usually good, reliable sources of PI. Uh, Tyler, do you have anything, or Brian, anything to say? About um, yeah. Uh, a lot of times, I mean, particularly when we have uh, gauges down hole, um, we will uh, and. It, um, watch the fall off of the well uh, for a couple of days to maybe uh, a little more than a week. Um, and generally from that, you'll get a, you'll see that, that trend uh, kind of flattening out. Um, and we found that oftentimes it lines up with our defit. So um, if you haven't done a defit um, and you've got a gauge, uh, you can pretty easily get uh, initial reservoir pressure from that as well. Um, as long as you um, like, blown the burst disc on it and uh, ahead of production and everything so yeah and I, for me it's uh, initial reservoir pressure is one of the crucial pressure points for any accurate description of the reservoir and it's something that we put a lot of time into discussing and trying to to figure out how we were doing this we weren't running in the Haynesville bottom hole pressure gauges very often we were didn't, performing the occasional defit, but that wasn't across the entire field. And it was much later kind of in the development stage of our Haynesville position where we were doing that. Um, so we were using things like um, geo models where we had measured some of these pressure gradients. We were using um, the working fluids from the drilling when we entered the formation and we were, what was the mud weight as an upper limit for what that initial reservoir pressure might be. Um, so we were we were discussing some of these things, but uh, really we tried to use all of them. Uh, one of the things we talked about was if we have enough downtime between toe prep on the completion and actually pumping the first stage, monitor pressure build up at surface, use that in combination with the estimate from mud weight during drilling and some of the initial casing head pressures all those things together can get us in the ballpark, but it's not as good as downhole gauges or defits and things of that nature. But there are ways around it to get close enough. And as production engineers, we're very comfortable with close enough and, and most of what we do. So that's my experience with it. Great. Um, well, we're at the hour. Uh, John, would you prefer to keep answering questions or just wrap up? Yeah, we can do one or two more. And uh, if people sign off, that's okay. Sure. Um, so the next question is, can we use RTA to esti estimate cluster efficiency? That's a good question. Um, you, you can use it to gain insights, uh, like not categorically, but, um, but yeah, there are there is a paper, I, I think that uh, Dave Anderson wrote with somebody else that uses um, a type curve technique that kind of backs out um, the like the cluster efficiency. Um, I forget the, the paper number. I can probably make that available later. Um, but I mean, cluster efficiency is usually like uh, step up or step down tests. I mean, you talk to any completions engineers and they'll tell you how to do cluster efficiency. And of course you can do DAS and you can run fiber strings and you can really get to know the real answers. But to get some early insight from RTA, well, that really comes to you if you have integrated reservoir studies and you've got a, an understanding of the perm to begin with. Um, if you add too many fracks, if you make all your clusters 100% cluster effectiveness, um, you may end up with perms that are too low compared to what you're seeing in core. And the corollary, of course, is that you don't put in enough fracks, right? And now your, your perm is way too high. So that that's one way of looking at it. And again, that... Um, that type curve technique I was talking about. Dave, you're, I can see you muted there. I don't know if you've got anything to, if you're listening, but if you hear this, you could jump in. Yeah, let me, I, sorry, I'm just getting out of the place where there's lots of noise here. Uh, 
Yeah, I don't know the name of the talking about. Um, what I will say is there, I, I agree with what John said. I think any anytime you're trying to get cluster efficiency as an output from RTA, it's a, it's somewhat of an inference, sort of like uh, a net effective fracture height. You have to use a lot of different sort of um, uh, disparate pieces of data and kind of bring them together into the model to, you know, there's no direct deterministic way to get that answer out of it. Where we have gotten the most direct intel on cluster efficiency is when we do it, when we've done a side-by-side -side comparison with a well where the number of frac entry points is a known parameter. And that would only be the case in say a cemented sliding sleeve completion where, where you have, you know, a, a known cluster efficiency, I say in air quotes, of 100% because it's a pinpoint completion. And then you would look at the plug and perf beside it and, and do a benchmark comparison. And we've been successful in doing a few of those over the years, um, but that would be a very specific case that in, in most cases, you know, because 99% of what's out there in the lower 48 is, is, is plug and perf completions, you know, and you don't have a, uh, an analog uh, pinpoint side by side, uh, you can't necessarily do that. Um, so really the only other way to get clarity on that is to take direct measurements. And companies like Shell have done this where they, where they go in with fiber and they measure you know, during the completion and during subsequent production and, and actually measure. Uh, but, but yeah, you can't get it directly out of RTA and, unless you use some of these sort of inference techniques that John's talking about and, and so on. So that's my two cents worth there. Thanks, Dave. Um, in the chat window, there's been some discussion about machine learning. It started, you know, with predicting liquid loading using things other than Turner or Coleman. Um, and people said, you know, can we use machine learning with Harmony? Uh, the answer is yes. And I have to say, I, I've, I've just recently been diving into this, this topic. So uh, we have a new product called Analytics Explorer, and it's going to take all of your Harmony results uh, and, and geology results, if you want, and apply um, an algorithm called gradient uh, boosting tree. And the whole idea here is to take all of these things that sometimes we haven't historically considered to be related to each other when describing well performance and provide insight um, about these relationships to help us make be a better decision for the next well. So we have the, the horsepower to do this, but we're so early in the learning process, I can't, I, I haven't learned anything yet because I haven't got my hands into it yet to use all the horsepower. But um, if this is something anyone wants to try, just contact Saga or I, and we'll be happy to, to help, help you teach us as well. Okay, um, awesome. Well, I really wanna thank Saga Wisdom so much for coordinating part one and part two. Um, I've learned a lot. I, I think everyone here has. And Saga will be sending everyone an update once these uh, recordings are available and, and hosted. So uh, with that, thanks again, Saga. Yeah, and I'm gonna encourage everybody to go to the Saga Wisdom website and subscribe to our newsletter. If you do that, it's an easy way for us to keep you up to date with events such as this one, when we're posting our recordings, the release of our subsurface courses. Um, if you visit our website, you'll see we're big into digital education, providing masterclass instructors, uh, addressing um, all of the subsurface sciences that you're interested in. Um, so please, please do us a favor and, and snoop around there for a bit. Thank you uh, for everybody for tuning in. We appreciate your support. We're around for any questions. Feel free to reach out to me directly if you uh, have any um, need for follow-up. Thanks a lot.